hardest part is figuring out what you want to master. Focus on your product. Can you tell somebody that they suck? You gotta just go for This is exactly what I want to do for a living. You can't even tell somebody that their breath is fit for life. Eddie, thanks for coming and doing this, man. Drama, thanks for having me. You know what I thought was funny is, and I don't want to uh, put you on blast here, is that you told me that you were a little nervous because you don't do a lot of stuff like this. Very nervous. But you like jump over canyons and rockets and you, you know what I mean? Isn't that interesting how... Well, I'm in my element more or less doing that. This, I'm totally out of my element. Yeah. You feel the most in your element when you're like pushing the boundaries of... Yeah. I don't know if it's pushing the boundaries, but I'm 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 familiar with it. This yeah. I'm totally unfamiliar. Does it feel like a? Because the one thing that gets me about all these situations, whether it be being on camera, or like you know risking bodily injury, don't you feel out of control in those circumstances, or the no, opposite? No, not at all. Really? Uh, if I felt out of control, I wouldn't do it. That'd yeah. just be stupid. Yeah. So every time you feel, yeah, pretty much. Uh, you know, doing stunts in, in feature films and professionally, you can't be out of control. No one would ever hire you. Yeah. Nobody wants a, a lunatic out of control. <laughs> yeah. In fact, they like somebody that's pretty predictable to do the stunts. Yeah. I guess that might be sort of also the misconception between like when, you know, your average person looks at a stunt guy or someone doing these crazy stunts, they just can't wrap their heads around it and it just looks like complete chaos. But to you, you know exactly what you're doing. More or less. Yeah. Um, First of all, there's a there's a, a very clear distinction between between being a professional stuntman and being a daredevil. Yeah, there's a clear distinction between that. And yeah. I am a professional stuntman. Yep. Um, and being a professional stuntman, you're dealing with a lot of other professionals that count on rely on you to be as predictable as you can be doing yeah. the action. So even when you were, and we'll get to this kind of at the end because I want to lead to it. But even when you did the big uh snake river rocket jump you felt that was more stuntman to you <clears throat> the only way i could do it was to approach it like a technician um if you take away all the hype and all the sentiment and all the hoopla of it to me in the back of my head it was simply doing an elaborate stunt sequence yeah, yeah. get travel a, a distance and cross a canyon and and stay a lot yeah, and um, to me it was a it, it, technically it was a stunt sequence as if you know I was the stunt coordinator on all three of the Jackie Chan Rush Hour movies. Yeah, and we had huge elaborate stunt sequences. Yeah, and so so I just looked at this as from a technician standpoint, it's a stunt sequence. I just got to pull it off, and I'm going to happen to be the stunt guy doing the stunt that I designed. Yeah, did you ever did you have to come up with any sort of fear management? like technique because let me tell you oh, this. absolutely because <laughs> let me tell you this i you know like like i was telling you off camera i did some years uh on a reality tv show on mtv and a lot of the stuff that we did was really stunt based you know i did a thing where i stood in the middle of a bull ring and let a bull run me over i was a huh. human cannonball uh got shot out of a cannon and you know all sorts of different stuff but i just developed this thing where i decided it was worth doing I knew the video would be really good and I just had to literally turn my brain off and just do what I know I needed to do and not take any common sense or any anything into into play for my stuff. What did you how do you get around that fear that everything's telling you not to do something? Well, first let me ask you, were you scared when you were doing all those things? To death. I am not a stunt man. I am not a daredevil. I just knew it would make good video. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, some of those are make videos that you watch and when they go bad and it's just oh, uh, yeah. awful. I get scared all the time. I am not, you know, people think you're a stunt guy and you're this macho, yeah. whatever, and that's not me at all. Yeah. I and mean, I'm scared of heights, I'm scared of spiders, I'm, <laughs> all those things. I love that. Um, no, you just, it, it's not the absence of fear that makes you, it's how you deal with it mm -hmm. in the face of it. Do you... Do you vapor lock or do you act? And, uh, and um, you know, roads are full of flat squirrels that couldn't make a decision one way or another, you know? That's a good one. Um, I deal with my fear. I have a way of just dealing with my fear head yeah. on and, and hopefully not in a total panic mode. 
And did you have to consciously develop that skill? Yes, absolutely. And was there any, did anyone, uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at is like, did anyone, pardon me if I just sound stupid here, but like, did you ever meet uh, another stunt guy and say, hey, how do you deal with this? Like, is it something that you get tips on and it's like, you know? Yeah, different guys deal with it different. I have noticed, I have very close friends that, you know, some of them are bull riders and whatever that became stuntmen or cowboys. Everybody has a different way of dealing with their fear. Yeah. Some guys block it out. They don't even think about it. I, I, I don't know how they do it. They yeah. just do it. I, I always think. I'm very conscious of my fear. Um, and the worst thing is I've seen when things go bad yeah. and it sticks in my head too. That's yeah. the worst. I can't block that out either. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm fearful every time I go to work. Yeah, oh, man. It's just that I think is, and also not in a cheesy way, but I think that that is a real skill set and like mental muscle that people like you have that ev- everyday average people could really benefit from if they had a piece of it. You know what I mean? Because so much of what people don't do, it could be deciding what college to go to or what job applications to turn. It could be the littlest thing, but it's it's all fear-based, right? And yeah, it's oh, like- Oh, absolutely. It, people's fears are very real. Yeah. I mean, you can't diminish someone's fear yeah. of something, whatever that something is. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I just think fear management, time. you know, is a interesting. It's something that I wish there was more uh, books about or TED Talks or, you know what I mean? I yeah. wish there was more. Hey, listen, I'll be honest. I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you the truth. I was fearful for coming here today. I kept my sweaty palms and, and yeah. this is out of my environment and, and I risk looking like a complete fool publicly and it's, <laughs> it's scary. Well, we'll never let that happen. Yeah. This is much safer than I'm sure most of what you've done. Well, it depends on what you consider safe, you know? <laughs> it's, it's just so funny to me, though, how, like, the... Because I deal with it, too, but the physical... When you're facing a physical danger and, like, a social danger, it feels very similar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what it's I mean? A, it's scary. It's weird. It's... Yeah, it's an uncomfortable kind of feeling. Yeah. All right, well, let's get into your story. I'm really curious, <clears throat> you know, about how this all kind of came about. Where did you grow up? I grew up here in Southern California. Nice. And I still live in the city in the area I was born and raised, Manhattan Beach, California. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I, I grew up, I, I I was kind of a hell raiser as a kid. Yeah? Um, like getting in trouble or what type oh, of yeah, stuff? Oh, I, yeah. I, no, all kinds of trouble. It, my, If you knew my background before I got into stunts, it was, it was uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could have easily ended up behind bars for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just fortunate. Uh, over the course of different things, serendipitously, I ended up in my line of work. Yeah. I started as a professional stuntman at 17 years old. Wow. So, And I never looked back. What about like family? Like, do you have siblings? And I, I have one older brother, but we're estranged for many, many, many years. Got it. So, but what about when you were younger? Like, did you guys, <coughs> you kind of live separate lives or? Yeah, completely. Got it. And what type of stuff other than, you know, you don't have to talk about the, the trouble stuff if you don't want to, but like, what did you do yeah. for fun? cause trouble yeah no, i mean listen i did things I, i'm not ashamed i was a juvenile at the time but but just before i entered the film business i was uh, 17 years old or uh, 16 turning 17 i was arrested for grand theft auto <laughs> assault with a deadly weapon joyriding all these felonies because i ran with the wrong crowd yeah and and that was the culmination of an evening of drinking and partying and not wanting to walk home after a party. So a buddy of mine stole the vehicle. He hotwired a a little pickup truck, and I jumped in it as a passenger. Um, And we went in Hermosa Beach for about two miles, and and the police set up a barricade. And my buddy, Tony, decides he's not going to stop. He's going to ram the barricade. Uh So we rammed it. Next thing I knew, I was laying on the ground with a shotgun at my head and and with a list of felonies behind me, just because I happened to be hanging out with bad people. Wow. It's that thrill seeker thing. You well, know? it was, I will say it was very, nowadays you'd get shot. But, yeah. But back then, you know, they, they did point guns at you, but they didn't shoot you so quickly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I ended up in jail as a juvenile and wow. uh, I had to make a very serious course correction right then and there, or, or that would have been my life. And what happened as far as like, how did you, did you end up Getting probation, or did you kind of get out of that? Well, or? no. As a juvenile, thank goodness, back then, yeah. Uh, you, yeah, they, and I had a pretty clean record. I didn't really do anything too bad, and they, they gave me a, a chance to clean up my life. Gotcha. 
which serendipitously I, I, I did. I got lucky and entered in the film business as a professional stuntman at 17. So tell me about how that happened. How do you go from a troublemaker, uh, running around, getting into trouble, to this line of work? Well, <clears throat> it all starts back to I met Evil Knievel as a child. I met him here in Southern California at a, at a racetrack called Ascot, which was in Gardena, California. It's no longer there. Got it. And uh, I met him as a kid, and, and every kid at that time thought Evil Knievel was the coolest. Yeah. And I met him, and, you know, the, the man wore a cape. Who You know what I mean? He was oh, a superhero. Yeah. It's so good. And um, I met him, and I knew after meeting him, I didn't want to be anything else but like him. That's what did it. That's what did it. And, and, do you remember and, what it was? Because like, obviously you knew how cool he was, and you had seen him on TV and stuff. Do you remember what it was about meeting him that really made you? Oh, yeah. The guy just, you know, he had a cape and a cane and a smile, and he was really, he was really nice to me. And it was just, I, I don't know how to explain it. It's yeah. like meeting... Elvis and Liberace all at once. Yeah. You know, this guy yeah. was larger than life. Yeah. Um, about three weeks later, I had a, a Schwinn Stingray, mm -hmm. and we were jumping trash cans, and I promptly ate it really bad, and I broke my arm. Oh, at, yeah. And I thought, wow, that's I'm like Evil Knievel. I mean, it was, everybody wanted to be like him at that time. That's so cool. So that's what you thought. That didn't deter you. You were like, oh, no, I'm closer not to all. being I like mean, my hero. Yeah, I mean, he kind of made you suck up you know, the crashing and burning because he did it. Yeah, that's so good. What age was that at that you had the, the bike wreck? Uh, I think it was like 12 years old Got or it. something. 12, 13. No, nah, probably 12, 11 or 12. Got it. And then how did the opportunity to actually be in well, film type or make any money to, from to, this? To make a long story short is from bicycles, you know, I quickly graduated to motorcycles. Yep. And I'd race dirt bikes, you know, and... Um, I was fairly decent on a dirt bike, and I met people while I was racing dirt bikes. And um, along came uh, a gal, and she was a, a girl that I knew in the neighborhood, and she started dating a, like a real stunt guy. Uh -huh. And he uh, he said, uh, "Oh, you can ride and stuff." He goes, "You come to work with me." He he, you know, was doing stunts, and I tagged along a few times. And you know, at that time. Uh, it was, at that point, it was 1979, 1980. Yeah. It was the beginning of the heyday of cheesy TV action shows. Yeah. There was BJ and the Bear. There was It was starting for Dukes of Hazzard, Fall Guy, Chips, all yeah. of those. Yeah. And as a 17-year-old kid, it was kind of easy to get in with these older cowboys if yeah. you could just keep your mouth shut and do what they told you. Yeah. And that's how I started. How cool. You know, I... I, I we used to call it back then, you know, you were, a, if you were a young kid in that environment, you were known as a peckerneck, uh -huh. you know, these, <laughs> these stunt guys, you come here, peckerneck, and you do all that, <laughs> but they'd throw you a bone now and then, and if you went for it, yeah. they'd, they'd give you something more and something more, and if you, you know, keep coming back, yeah. and you did what they, they said, that, you know, eventually one day, I think I was like, I don't know, 19 or 20, they said, hey, you're no longer a peckerneck. You're in the NFL now. Oh, wow. And, 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 and it was kind of the thing that you earned as you, le you, earn as you learn. Yeah. These guys would teach you and tutor you and kind of like an apprenticeship. Yeah. One that you get your ass kicked, though, yeah. <laughs> at work. But before I knew it, I was like you know, 20, 21, and I was making serious cash really? being a Hollywood stuntman. That it was quickly. bitching. Well, yeah, it escalated. In fact, I spent my 21st birthday, right? Mm -hmm. Most people are out at bars and whatever. Yeah. My 21st birthday, I was getting hit by a car <laughs> in a movie, uh, uh, some cheesy movie called Lucky 13 with Eric Stoltz. Yeah. And that was my 21st birthday, and I was a Hollywood stuntman, making a ton of money. That's so good. What'd you do on your 21st birthday? Um, let me ask you this. What do you think, because this is something I'm also fascinated by, is like, what do you think... Because there's almost people think of two different types of people. One is the young guy that's getting in trouble, stealing cars, doing that sort of stuff. I can relate. There's the other guy that is staying quiet, being humble, waiting for an opportunity, listening, learning. You know what I'm saying? This other version of you. What do you think switched that took you from like what you know people think of as like, oh, delinquent, you can't teach him anything. He's not going to pay attention. He probably just is full of himself to like this person who's so dedicated to learn and, and grow. What you have, what I look for in the younger guys is a balance of both. 
Uh-huh. If you're the quiet guy that's sitting there waiting for the opportunity, you're never going to get it. Yeah. If you're the the overly enthusiastic, loud guy that's unpredictable, yeah. you stay away from it. Someone that has a balance of both, someone that'll go for it, but is also humble and quiet enough to learn yeah. when they need to. It's and, kind of a balance of both. You can't be either one. Yeah. And you think that was just kind of your instincts in that early situation? That and a lot of luck. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I knew, I knew, excuse me, I knew I was out of my environment around these older cowboys because yeah. they were like cowboys. And here yeah. I was some young peckernectus from, you know, yeah. the s- Southern California. And yeah. these guys are rough. And that you have to just kind of, um, I don't know, I, I, I call it street smarts. You yeah. got to figure it out. It's also, it seems to me like when people find something that they're truly interested in, like you're willing to. Oh, yeah. S- shut up and learn. You know what I mean? It's like if you put someone, someone who might be uh, completely out of line or crazy in school or in sports or in this thing or that thing, you put them in the right scenario and all of a sudden, you know, it seems like that happens a lot too. Well, I knew for me personally, I was not academic. I barely got out of high school. Even though I had good grades, I, I just, I didn't like the authori- authoritative figures in school. Yeah. So it wasn't my academics. It was just my relating to authority but i knew out of high school i wasn't going to college i knew that yeah. i wasn't so for me it was sink or swim i better i better um i better excel in this environment because i have nothing else yeah you know i don't have any music talent i don't have any the, it was either i better be a a professional stuntman and i better be good at it yeah. or i was gonna be like waiting tables or something the rest yeah. of my life yeah so let me ask you this how do you like is there like stuntman school no it's just no. kind of like, hey. Well, in, nowadays it's a totally different environment. Uh-huh. It really it's like night and day now uh, compared to what it used to be. Like. Uh-huh. I like to say that nowadays it's nearly impossible to become a professional stuntman. How come? It's a, it's a dying art form uh-huh. because it's dying from two different areas. From one area, technology and computer uh, 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 computer imagery. Yeah. We can take five stuntmen in the, in the computers and everything and make 50 stuntmen out of them. Yeah. So it's dying from that end. And then on the other end, it's dying because of the attorneys. Yeah. It's dying you mean because like cracking of cracking down on, on risk? Yeah. Liability and and bonding and insurance. Yeah. No think about this. When when I go to work, I'm working for a studio or I'm working for somebody that is responsible for what I do. Yeah. There's somebody and there's usually a lot of money behind it. Yeah. They're not gonna take a chance on someone that's unproven. No insurance company is going to sign off on some young kid wrecking a car, possibly over wrecking the car and ending up in a building or hurting or injuring someone. Yeah. First thing they want to, even me as a stunt coordinator, when I hire people, the insurance companies and the bonding company want to know who I'm hiring and what is the justification for me hiring them. Yeah. If I bring in a new person, they're going to say, why are you hiring a new person? We don't want to insure that or bond that. Yeah. So it's kind of a catch 22 how do you get into the business with no experience and get someone to say, I'm going to risk my career and everything on you? Yeah. It's nearly impossible. Yeah. I tell people, you stand a better chance these days of being a working actor yeah. than you ever do a working stunt guy. How are young stunt guys, even or girls, even getting in now? It is, it is like a stroke of lightning yeah. if it happens. Yeah. It's either nepotism or somebody really, or, or it's a special skill set that no one else has. Yeah, like a certain stunt or something. Yeah, a certain stunt. Uh, that that and and even then, it's it doesn't mean that they're going to sign off on. And and every year something happens, and then the insurance companies and the bond companies react to it. I think uh, last year, unfortunately, there was a gal that was killed in uh, I think uh, one of the De- Deadpool movies. Yeah, I remember hearing up about in that. Canada. Now she was an expert, expert, expert. Yeah. motorcycle rider uh-huh. expert but she did not have film savvy in fact th- i think this was her first feature film got it so she didn't know in her mind apparently that you don't have to go all out on the first take yeah. just warm up to it yeah so apparently she just you know pinged it all the way and stuffed herself into a wall or something got it and it killed her yep. but what that did was it made all the insurance companies and bonding companies now go wait a minute okay now we're going to really look at somebody if they don't have experience on the set. It doesn't yeah. matter how good they are at their craft. Yeah. If they don't have set experience, we're not going to allow it. Yeah, that's even harder. 
Because now yeah. where do you even start? Right. So what you do is you go back to the people that are already in the business. Yeah. You you they're the ones you hire. Yeah. And and once in a while, a, a second generation or third generation, someone will take a chance. Yeah. Through nepotism, but it's it's nearly impossible. From one end, it's dying because of the insurance, the lawyers, and the bonding, and on the other end, it's dying because stuntmen are being replaced by computers. Yeah. Yeah, that part makes so I get that. So it's a dying art form. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it for anybody. Yeah. And if you do get the chance, then you have to actually perform. You, you have to be, doing stunts is almost, you've got to be perfect almost every single time. Yeah. I like to say, you know, Michael Jordan, he, he misses baskets in the, in the playoffs. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. and if, if we only got our job right half of the time, mm -hmm. we'd either be dead or out of a job yet. In other professions, you could be right only half the time and you, you end up in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, 100%. So it's a very, very rough industry to get into if you're lucky enough to even get the chance. Is there like practice? Like, is there like a, so, not, a not like, um, I don't mean like on the set. I mean, like, do you? you yeah, you, you do things to kind of hone your skills. Sure. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's, there's practice, but, you know, how often certain things you can't practice. Yeah. You just have to use your, you're, I, I like to say we have these things we we do a, a we call it a, someone will say how's this going to turn out and we'll say well we'll give you a swag at it yeah. what's a swag scientific wild ass guess <laughs> but it's based on two things yeah. instinct and experience yeah you think well I've done something similar to this mm -hmm. if I kind of do it similarly I should have a similar outcome yeah that's scientific wild ass guess that's true what about do you remember like when you first you know, was there a moment where you first, uh, <clears throat> whether it be got a paycheck or got something where you're like, oh, wow, I'm going to be able to like actually live off of this, like pay my bills being a stuntman? Like, yeah, you know. Where's that coming from? It's pretty cool, though, whatever it is. <laughs> but what's it even? My computer's not even plugged in. We got it goes. Kind of cool. Uh, somebody must have their Bluetooth. No, it's all right. I'm glad, it was, I'm glad it was your mess up and not mine. Yeah, but I heard a noise earlier, and I was like, what computer did that come from? The, like, email noise or whatever? Yeah. How's this work? Did you just cut, or are we still... Uh, I think I'll, I'll end up cutting it. Oh, okay. So it matches the audio, but we'll just cut this part out. to check to make sure, because if he's turning it up, not knowing that... It should be off. I turned it off, and we'll see. All right, you're still going, right? Yeah. Um, so the question was, did you... You know, was there like a first check or a first gig or anything where you're like, holy cow, like I, this yeah. Is, yeah, I can make a living here. Yeah. Yeah. At first I, I looked at it and, and, you know, my parents at that time were still alive uh -huh. and a check came and, you know, my mom, she's such a, she was such a worry wart. Uh -huh. She was so worried about me, but then the check came and she went, wow, that, okay, you can actually make some money doing it. But we thought it was like a passing thing, but then, you know, checks started coming on top of coming on before you knew it, I, I I was like, I felt like a baller. I was like 19 years old and making more money than the teachers that used to teach me. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, wow. Did you feel like a young Evil Knievel? Did you ever go buy a cape? Never, no. No cape? I, I wouldn't, I, and to this day, people even ask me when I jump the can, are you gonna wear a cape? No. <laughs> I, you know, to me, there's only one Evil Knievel, yeah. and I'm not him. Yeah. And my personal feelings is, anybody that wears a cape trying to be him yeah. is just a bad Elvis impersonator. It's true. Yeah. That's my opinion. I know there's yeah. guys that do wear capes and have nicknames and whatever. Of course. That's not me. Yeah. No, you have a good clear head. I think at nineteen, getting a couple paychecks from some movies, I would have been I would have at yeah. least had a cane and been like, What do you mean? No, but I did live kind of wildly. I did. I did mean you? money was coming in and I was like, Man, this is like rock star life. Yeah. Better than rock star. I'm a stunt man. Yeah. And it was like so cool. That's so cool. You know, it was yeah, it was a time that, that uh but I got humbled quickly, but at the time I was, I was balling. What I humbled you quickly? First injury. Did you have like a bad one? I an had, early I bad had, one? I'm a, sure you've a had a lot. few bad ones, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Did you have yeah. an early bad one that like... Well, you know, you ne near near bad, real bad ones. Uh -huh. Really near bad. I and mean, it caught your attention. Say, wait, this can really, this can really mess you up yeah. if, you, if you don't tone it down. Do you have one in memory that you could maybe... I want to wrap my head around like what what a near bad one... Uh, is uh, like okay in in 
think it was 1999, I was working on a um, a show I'd worked on, Walker, Texas Ranger, uh -huh. a Chuck Norris series, which yeah. I had fun on, you know? Uh -huh. And I did a, a car jump that I've done over a hundred of these, big car jumps, right? So this was a routine, if you can call these routine, a routine one, and we put a another stuntman to ride passenger with me. Uh -huh. And... And unfortunately, that day we had a bad day. It was a, it was an ugly wreck, and mm -hmm. for me, it broke my back severely in three places and collapsed a lung and everything else. Unfortunately, my friend who was sitting next to me was killed. Really? Yeah, and we were smashed in the car together. Although we had a roll cage. Yeah. And you know that that certainly you kind of go, wow, the difference between me and him, and we're right next to each other. Yeah. Um, you know, it was just, it was a sobering wake up call too. I and mean, is that just, like just kind of, I mean, did anything crazy go wrong or is that no, just an aspect No, of, it was, I mean, it, 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 we'd take up the whole show talking about, but it, nothing went wrong. Yeah. You know, certain stunts you're going to do are going to be really rough. Mm -hmm. You just don't know the severity of how rough, or at least you anticipate it's not going to be as rough. And like I said, I've done over a hundred of those without any major things that yeah. was just one you know it's the laws of averages yeah you do it enough you're gonna pay a price that sometimes is is rougher than you yeah. think yeah because no car lands the same even the same car yeah they don't land the same after you fling them through the air at 70 miles an hour yeah. they're all gonna land differently and what did that do like did that did that postpone your career at all no, or it not just at made all. you it like just, no, it made me take, uh, you know, take a little, of course, it made me change some things I do. You know, now uh, I'll say, just put a dummy in the car with me as a passenger yeah. where there's no reason to put a person. But yeah. at the time we were like, all right, we'll make him some money. I'll make some, we'll do this jump. And yeah. uh, so, you know, you, you adapt. If you don't, then you're just stupid. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but we'd done so many, like Dukes of Hazard, we'd throw two guys in the car all the time, yeah. even though one's driving and the other one's just it was just something you did and um but it was a wake-up call i mean yeah. there's been a few things like that that you know yeah. i've lost some friends and you thought well you know one of the things we deal with a lot are helicopters mm -hmm. dealing with them all the time doing what and flying them jumping, fly, out of them? Ju jumping out of them hanging on to them yeah. uh, just all kinds of things with helicopters yeah and most of the time everybody perceives them as fun you know they're cool you have a, you're flying around a helicopter but you know those things fall out of the sky. Yeah, they scare. And me. Uh, in in nineteen, I think eighty six, on a, another Chuck Norris thing uh, movie, I think it was a Michigan action. One of my friends was strapped to the outside of a helicopter uh, in the Philippines, and it crashed and it killed him. Jeez. You know they happen on Airwolf. Another friend was killed in the helicopter. Went down on a TV show called Airwolf, and that makes you pause a little bit and go, wait. Helicopters are cool, and we deal with them all the time. But yeah. you know, when these things go down, it's serious. Yeah. So you know, yeah. things like that happen, and you kind of go, "Well, wait a minute, we're we're playing, but with big boy toys here, and there's big boy consequences when it goes bad." I just how how did you not like? What kept you from quitting? Well, to several things. Some, you know what I mean? Like I can't imagine if like like my it's combination. Thing is, like I do with this podcast, right? If I, if my friend who had a podcast passed away from podcasting, I'd be like, I'm done. Uh, you, know, well, I, this is, you know what I mean? Combination of things keep you from quitting. One is obviously the financial, you know, for me, where else was I going to go? I told you I didn't go to college, uneducated. Yeah. Uh, what else was I going to do? And then once you do it for a while, yeah. you can't go to be a clerk somewhere you will you will go stir crazy that's true you know if, if two weeks earlier you were doing car chases and jumping out of buildings and jumping from helicopter and then you're in a place in a cubicle yeah you're going to want to jump out the window yeah so you know at a certain point you just can't go yeah. back yeah i get that man you get kind of used to the for me i do get used to the um it's kind of like a riding a roller coaster. You, you get scared to death, and then it's over with, and then you, you can't wait. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that gets addicting. I get it. And I could see how it just is like, you know, not to downplay, obviously, what happens to people, but like it's part of the job you chose. You know what I mean? I yeah. could see oh, yeah. that becoming part of the mentality. Yeah, you can't really complain a lot because it's it's nobody forced you into it, and yeah. there's a million guys that would love to be in your shoes. Yeah. You know? What about like, do you remember any... Um, was there a particular movie or job or gig or anything you got that you were like, oh, this is insane? 
There's, you know. there's been a few. There's been a Can few. Can you tell me about? Uh... I, you know, I told you I, I'm terrified of heights. Yeah. Hate heights. Which is amazing. And, and in 1995, I did a movie, a Charlie Sheen movie called uh, Shadow Conspiracy. Uh -huh. And they came up with this elaborate sequence from the 21st floor mm -hmm. of a building, but outside the building on the window washer's platform. I had to be on this window washer's platform and they were going to blow a cable, which meant this thing was going to break and be suspended by one tiny cable. And it would take me from the 21st floor all the way down to the 17th floor. And I'd be hanging there and it terrified me. But you know, we set it up all great, Yeah. but just looking down below 17 floors and seeing the traffic and the people. And we got through the sequence, um, and leading up to it, you know, days leading up to it, I I was just nervous, going, okay, that, this sucks. Why did why did I ever say yes to this? Yeah, yeah. Um, because this was one of those ones that that you know, a lot of stunts, if you mess up or something goes wrong, you're going to just end up in the emergency room with some stitches or broken bones. Yeah. There's a there's a few stunts that if anything goes wrong, you're you're not you're going to be you know in the in the morgue. You're yeah. not coming back. Yeah. This was one of those ones that everything had to go right. Yeah. So we do this thing and, and I have sleepless nights coming up to it. I'm that nervous. Like, okay, I'm double, triple, quadruple checking everything. The yeah. special effects guys have all these cables. So we do the thing, mm -hmm. right? And I get through it and I'm petrified the whole time. And I'm like, okay, we're done. The evening was done and we got it in the can. And I never have to worry about this again. Yeah. Well, the director and the producers love the shot so much they say, we want to spend the, I don't know, million and a half dollars and we want to do this again Ugh. and film it from a different perspective. And Worst I say, case. you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> yeah. and, and they want to spend the money because it's very expensive. They want to come back a week later and shoot it again, exactly like we did it, but they're just going to film it differently. Yeah. And I go, oh, crap. So a whole week again, I have to go through all of that. And I'm thinking, okay, I got lucky once. Now it's really pressing my luck. I got to do this whole thing again. Yeah. So we came back like a week later and I and had, did it to, again. had to do it again. Yeah. I mean, when you sign up for the job and you say yes, yeah. you better follow through with what you say. Oh, man. So it sucked. That's and too good. It was awful. <laughs> oh, man. What about like uh, anything as far as, um, you know, did you have any big moment like, where I guess what I'm trying to get at is like a, a role or a part of a movie or something that just seemed crazy that you were even in this movie or that you met this person or that, you know, where you sure. watched the scene back on the movie or that crazy. it had gotten to this level. Well, I mean, would you say this level, you mean epicness, coolness, I mean, difficulty? Like, like, a, like I'm in this movie or I'm doing oh, this. Yeah, you know? I, for me, I, several times, several mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. but... There were some that were really cool. There were some that were really, I was blown away at the epicness of it. I yeah. mean, for instance, um, I'd never met Jackie Chan before. I never even worked with Jackie Chan. And I think in 2001 or something, I, I get contacted and say, listen, we're going to do a movie called Rush Hour. Uh -huh. It'll be Jackie Chan's first American film. He'd done some other films, but he never really did an American film production. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to do this thing called Rush Hour with Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker. And you're going to be the stunt coordinator. And, and you're going to have a big budget. And you're going to have to come up with some cool things. And I'd never even met Jackie Chan before. Yeah. And I thought, wow, I'm going to work with Jackie. This is how cool is this? Yeah. Um, we did Rush Hour. And it turned out to be a smash hit. Uh -huh. And I thought to myself, wow. Not only did I get to work with Jackie Chan. That if that wasn't cool enough, but we did a movie that was a hit. Yeah, huge hit. Then cut back years later, we do one called Rush Hour Three. Yeah. Now they're going to give me a stunt budget that is bigger than a lot of movies I've worked on. Uh -huh. Just my stunt budget. Yeah. And I get to hire hundreds of stuntmen and do elaborate. I mean, we blew up a casino in Vegas. Yeah. I mean, that was. I stood there on the set, going, I cannot believe. I'm partially responsible yeah. for what we're going to do on film. It yeah. was epic for me. It was fun. And those are great fun. movies. You were a part yeah. of something great there. It was. It was. It was fun. It was really, really cool to be to be part of it, but a major part because I actually, I came up uh, a a buddy of mine 
uh, was the second unit director who's responsible for the action, yep. named Conrad Pomazano. And Connie and I went to Vegas on our own and just walked the streets because we had to come up with a sequence yep. when, we, when we exploded this casino. Yeah. And we, he said, nothing is out of quite, let's just spitball here. What would you do if you had unlimited funds? Uh -huh. So Connie and I stood out in the middle of Las Vegas Boulevard and, uh, and I had a little Kino slip yeah. paper and a crayon. Uh -huh. And I said, well, okay, if we blow the casino, we got to do something with the guys. I said, let's do a big Tarzan swing yeah. where they swing out of the casino. He said, okay, then what happens? I said, uh -huh. um, I don't know. I saw, I saw a light post. I said, what if they got caught up in the light post and spun around that? He goes, okay, right. So I'm writing all this down on a, on a Kino slip. Yeah. What we would do once the building exploded. Yeah. And we came up with a whole end sequence on a Kino slip with a crayon and we flew home and Connie says, okay, you got some great ideas there. Now go, go tell Jackie what you think of them. Yeah. So I explained to Jackie, here's what I, I, I would come out of the casino, have you do a Tarzan swing, you spin around, you get hung up on the street and you think everything's okay, but then a semi's coming, so you guys have to like, he goes, okay, good, good, good. Yeah, 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 you go tell the director. So I told the director, the director loved it. So they both took my idea on the Kino slip after we you know, elaborated took it to, to the producers and, um, and everybody approved it. And pretty soon we got like just under three million, two point something million to make it actually work. Jesus. And we did. How cool is that? Like watching the, uh, the evolution. Yeah. Like yeah. From a wild ass idea on yeah. a Kino slip to actually on film. Yeah. Pretty damn cool. I saved I, all my notes from that too, by the way. Yeah. Thank God. So that, that's fun. That, that's one type of cool. Yep. The other cool for me was the first time I worked with Clint Eastwood. Yeah, yeah. That that dude to me is a movie star. I mean, Clint is a movie star. Yeah, and, he is. and one day, uh, the guy I normally double Charlie Sheen says to me, hey, uh, I think I'm going to sign to do a movie with Clint Eastwood called The Rookie, uh -huh. and he's going to direct it. And I went, wow. He goes, let's go, let's go meet him. You come with me, we'll go meet him. And, we, and I'm sitting in an office with Clint Eastwood. Hey, kid, how are you? <laughs> to me, that was a whole different type of cool. Yeah, yeah. And then I spent six months with him working hand in hand because he was the director. Yeah. And that was ultimate cool. That is so, so there's good. different types of yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. there's hanging from a helicopter and there's... conceptualizing a whole movie scene. And I, I, I did a movie years ago called Free Jack and I got to double uh, Mick Jagger. How uh -huh. cool is that? That's really cool. Yeah, the whole nother level of oh, cool. Oh, man. So did it, all the like stunt coordination uh, stuff come easily to you like being no. able to sit and conceptualize well, a scene like that no. no how'd you learn that well I, you don't really become a stunt coordinator until you've been a stuntman for a long time mm -hmm. and being a stuntman you kind of go oh, okay i'd if if i had my say i'd change this a little or if i had yeah. my say well sooner or later you get to the point where you become a stunt coordinator and it's like hey i do have the say <laughs> yeah yeah so let's try this or let's try that yeah. and see how that works out and sometimes it's a success. Sometimes it's a failure. Yeah, <laughs> you, know? yeah. you just, you just, usually I'll try and try things out on a, like a music video or a commercial or something no one's going to hear about first. Yeah, yeah. And then if it works, I'll apply it to something else on a bigger scale. Yeah. That's so good. So is that what you're working on now? Ma majority stunt coordinating? Are you still doing a lot of stunts or what's, what are you working on now? I'm trying to phase out just being, uh, doing stunts because. Yeah. You know, I'm old now. I'm beat up. And, it gets, and yeah, it gets harder only, on that Oh, body. yeah. <laughs> really hard. Yeah. And I spend more of the time now coordinating or doing stunts that aren't going to physically take a beating. Yeah. However, you still, once in a while, you uh, you just do it yourself, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I, I you know, I think the last stunt, quote unquote, that was going to be physical was on the pilot of the new magnum pi i did a stunt i probably shouldn't have done and it rang my bell but it was fun yeah for a little <laughs> while yeah you know how cool man um so let's get to this big snake river huh. jump so i guess my first question is what was the motivation you wanted well, to let, let's there were several motivations yep let's start with the fact um be, when I got in the business as a young stunt guy, an older stunt guy told me, he said, you never, you never really retire from this business. Uh -huh. This business retires you. Uh -huh. 
pretty soon you just get too old, too beat up. Yeah. And I've always thought of myself as like, you know, you never want to be the last guy at a party. Yeah. You always want to leave the party while it's going good. You want to leave, right? Yeah. You don't want to be the last guy at a party. Yeah. So me personally knowing that, okay, I've been doing stunts for a long time now. It's time to figure out how to gracefully stop doing them. Yeah. At the same time, I thought, you know, the whole reason I got in this business is because of Evil Knievel. And I knew there was one stunt, one thing Evil Knievel walked away from at the height of his fame. Yeah. In 1974, you know, he, he tried to jump the Snake River Canyon in a, a sky cycle, which is basically a rocket yeah. with a couple of wheels on it. Yeah. And he tried it. It didn't kill him, but he never, he vowed never to do it again. What happened when he did it? Uh, well, technically the parachute came out early. Got it. And so yes. he just went down into the canyon? Into the canyon, and, and by some miracle, he wasn't killed. Got it. But at the height of his career, he walked away never to do that again. So it, it must have freaked him. Who knows yeah. why he never did, but he never did. And for over 40 years, no one else has even tried it. Yeah. You know, Evil Knievel has those famous words, you know, that it's been over, you know, decades long and that canyon hasn't moved an inch mm -hmm. and there's not a long line of people trying to cross it. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe I, I who knows? I thought <laughs> audaciously, you know what? I could probably pull it off. Uh -huh. And I thought if I could pull it off, what a better way to, I mean, how many people in life get to finish the dreams of their hero? Yeah. You know, I never said I, I'm doing something evil can evil couldn't do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but but I would, if, if I could pull it off and survive, I'd finish out what he started. It's kind of like a, uh, the eighth, in, you know, a pitcher comes in, a closer comes in. Yeah. That doesn't mean the other pitchers suck. They're yeah. all part of the same team. Yeah. Closer just finishes it out. They're all part of the winning team. Yeah. So I thought to myself, if I could actually do this and live, I could finish out my hero's dream, and that would also be one hell of a mic drop for me to leave the business. Yep. Yeah. So, so there was, and it would be a way to honor, honor the man that inspired me. You know, there's a reason I named my rocket the Evil Spirit and not the Eddie Braun. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't about me or trying to. It was about paying homage to the guy that inspired me in the first place. Yeah, I so get that, that that was the nucleus of what started, and I had no idea how hard it would be when I said, "Oh yeah, I'm going to give it a shot." Because at that point, did you have any idea what? I mean, nothing. Any, yeah. Nothing Anything more other, than just what you described? Like, oh, it's well, kind of like a rocket with a... Well, yeah. And then you start finding out. Well, first of all, forget about the, the practicalness of it. Yeah. You go, in this day and age, tell the government you're going to launch a missile and you're going to climb in it and try and cross the canyon. See how well that goes. I didn't think about that part. Oh, man. <laughs> They're like, what? Yeah. You know, I said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and do exactly what Evil Knievel. You're going to climb in a rocket and try and fire it off. And man, first thing, I had to deal with it, Homeland Security. Yeah. You're going to do what? No, you're not. You know, they're wondering if I'm going to arm this thing with, <laughs> yeah. with uh, you know, whatever. It yeah. just, it was a, I think if I'd have known how hard it was going to really be, yeah. it may have scared me away from even trying. Really? Because it was, it took me, you know, at least four years. Jeez. And a hell of a commitment. You know, here's the funny thing. Everybody thought it was the coolest idea in the world. Yeah. Till I needed their support or money. Yeah, 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 of course. Like, we think this is great. Uh, you want you want us to sponsor you? Well, yeah, if you get killed, I don't think our brand is going to look so great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No one thought I could do it yeah. either. I don't yeah. think anybody really thought that I'd go through with it. And if I did go through with it, they said, you're, you're going to just, you're dead. Yeah. Did you, there's no way to practice that, right? Nope, there's not at all but it goes back to what i said a swag scientific wild ass guess yeah i had to look at it from from practical uh -huh. we know that evil knievel launched he didn't blow up on the launch pad we yeah. knew that his rocket actually took off yeah we knew that were you able to get so, his information what oh he used? yeah yeah first thing i did was i teamed up with the son of the original the, the man that built the rocket yeah bob truax he was a he was a very famous scientist, rocket yeah. scientist. Yeah. Well, he passed away, but his son, who was my age at the time, was a little kid at the time, yeah. he grew up, uh, Scott Truax, yeah. he grew up to be a fabricator, 
and he had all of his dad's pl- original plans and spare parts even. Got it. So at so least you knew first that. First thing I did was team up with him. Yeah. And he said, listen, if I follow my dad's plans to the T, I mean, we will build the, and we'll use spare parts. We'll build the exact same rocket. So then we knew, okay, if we have the exact same rocket and we have the same place and we have all the, we know at least this thing isn't going to, it shouldn't blow up right there on the launch pad. It should at least take off. Yeah. Okay. If it then does take off and the parachute doesn't come out early, common sense tells us I should have the power to get across this canyon. Yeah. Now all I got to do is figure out how to come down and not splat. Yeah. So... We built on everything. We used everything that Evil Knievel did as our test. Yeah. We took all that data and just built on that. We didn't try and reinvent the wheel here. We just yeah, made cool. the wheel roll a little better. That makes it so much cooler too, you know? It's just so much cooler that you didn't do well, some like... <coughs> yeah, carbon you know, like, fiber um, and computers. Yeah. No, like, this was as old like, school as it gets. Yeah. It's a tin can with duct tape and, and uh, a ball peen hammer. Oh, it man. really is. But you know what? It worked then and it worked now. Yeah. Oh, it would have been easy. Listen, it could have been a carbon fiber thing with a computer and it yeah. would have been a, a no brainer. Yeah. But that's not the point. That's true. No, it was done with the exact same... It's, it was like a time warp. Yeah. Going back 40 years to the exact same thing. Yeah, that's so cool. And take me through, like, when it comes down, I mean, so the day comes, you show up. I'm guessing you well, stuff yourself in that thing. It must not be too yeah, roomy. Not roomy at all. It was awful. It yeah. was awful. It was like, it picture, first of all, I'm scared, I'm scared to death because I, I literally, if this thing goes bad, mm-hmm. there's I'm pieces all over a canyon wall. Yeah. So I'm terrified already. Yeah. But I figured, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just, turn that part of my brain off and use the other part and yeah. figure, okay, we've done all the homework. Um, this is just another elaborate stunt sequence in a movie. I had to take this to movie terms yeah. because that's what I'm used to. That's what I've done for over 30 years. Yeah. So in my head, I pretended like this was just a movie set and I was just going to work doing a stunt, a gnarly one, but still a stunt yeah. in a movie. Yeah. I took all the drama of the whole evil could evil out of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was very uncomfortable. I had to climb into this thing. Imagine being zipped up with your arms and everything zipped up in a sleeping bag. There's no room. It's, it gets very claustrophobic. It's hot. It's at a funny angle. I was at 56 degrees, which means I'm pointed almost straight up. Yeah. Um, this thing is in essence a bomb. Are you feet first? Feet first. Oh, so, so you're like you're, upside down when you... Uh, not quite upside down, but you're close to inverted. 56 yeah. degrees is, is almost straight up and down yeah you you're 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 and and this rocket is a bomb actually if anything goes wrong it explodes and um even one of the engineers told me i says will i hear anything and he says by the time you hear anything you'll be in pieces all over the canyon so i had all that going on you <laughs> know a lot and and it didn't end quickly i had to sit in this rocket for probably 45 minutes on this bomb while everybody you know cameras are being set People are clearing away. You know, that's the other feeling is you're there by yourself ultimately and you see in the distance there's people, but they're far away. Yeah. And you have to sit there with yourself. How do you and, keep yourself uh, calm in that scenario? I did a couple things. One thing was I just, I closed my eyes a lot and just thought, you know, I'm kind of used to this being uncomfortable because, yeah. you know, in stunts we have to be uncomfortable and wait yep. a long time. Uh, the other thing is I had through one of my speakers on my in my headset, I was listening to Eminem's "Lose Yourself," uh-huh. and, now, and that's what I'm talking. You, you just have no idea how how uh, how every word of that song spoke to me on that day. Yeah. It was Eminem's "Lose Yourself." I hope someday, if I ever meet the cat, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna say, "Hey, you know, Eminem, thanks because man, I lived your 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 lose yourself." That's too good. So and, and I was like puking up all over myself, the yeah. nerves, just everything, yeah. you know. Uh, oh, but man. yeah, so I sat there listening to Lose Yourself. That's too good. One ear listening to everybody set cameras, tell me there. And then uh, when it came go time, I had told everybody I did not want a long countdown. Yeah. I said, cut it in half. I don't want to hear this 10, 9, eight. let's just start at five. Yeah. And when I hear one, I'm going to punch the button. And oh, so we'll you see. had a button. Oh, absolutely. Uh, no one was going to send me but me. Mm-hmm. So when it came down, they said, okay, we're ready. I kind of 
turn down the volume of M&M's Lose Yourself and listen to a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 and shot it and, and hit the button and hung on. When did you know you were out of harm's way? A few moments after I landed yeah. because there was no time during this whole thing that I like to say there was no fun times. It was just different degrees of terror. Yeah. The first one was that I actually left the the, the ramp. Yeah. Um, when I sat off the, we had we put a couple little measurement things inside the rocket to see what was really going to happen to me. Yeah. Well, according to all the, the gauges and everything, I went from zero to four hundred and thirty nine miles an hour in less than three seconds, and I went through eight G's. You don't pass instantly. out. No, fortunately, everybody thought I might. I did not pass out. And thank goodness, because I had to pull the parachutes. You did? Oh, yeah. Oh, my oh, God. Yeah. So you could have sure. simply just passed out from the Gs and you're it, done. Well, I would have never known. At that speed, I'd have just been a dent in the other side of the canyon. <laughs> that is insane. Um, no. So so what happened was I hit the button when I heard one, and I was gone. I mean, literally gone. Yeah. I, I It took a, a moment for my brain to actually catch up with the speed in which things were happening. Yeah. By the time I wondered, uh, the first thing was I, I wanted to know I was pointed in the right direction because yeah. I didn't know that. So I heard over my, my speaker, you're, you're in the right direction. You're okay. You're okay. Then I wondered if how, what I had to do to clear the Canyon. Well, I cleared the Canyon in the first half second. Uh -huh. So I was already beyond the Canyon. I was I, at 439 miles an hour. You are moving really fast. Yeah. Um, by the time I really, I got my wits about me, I was spinning, but it was a spiral, which is good. Uh -huh. You know, if you th see a football and it's spiraling perfect, it means it's going, but it's still spinning. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying, and I'm realizing that I'm, you know, I told you I'm scared of heights, <laughs> but I'm about 3000 feet up in the air, so, yeah. which is really high. Uh -huh. So I'm, 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 you know, I, I, a lot of things were going through my mind. I, I, I gotta, I gotta get this right. I got one shot or I'm dead. Yeah. Um, so I start pulling the parachutes, but I'm still going really fast. So I literally thought, okay, I cleared the canyon. The chute opened up, so I know there's a good chance I may survive this at this point, but I'm going really fast. So I think I'm going to smash into the other side and, and break my legs. Yeah. And this rocket was an open cockpit, uh -huh. which means part of my body was exposed. Uh-huh. My fear was, and that's the weakest part of the rocket. Yeah. So my fear always was that if I hit too hard on the other side, I would become decapitated because the rocket would simply close up at the opening in which half half my body was sticking out. Yeah. So I'm coming in really fast, thinking, "Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! I'm gonna break my legs or be decapitated here." Uh huh. So I hit. Finally, I hit, and it took a second, and I realized I wasn't decapitated. But I was really numb. I couldn't feel my legs. So I looked down to see if I saw blood or bones sticking out. And I didn't see any of that. I went, oh, all right. And then I started to move my legs. I go, wait, I can even move them. And, and then I realized, you know, I actually, and here's the thing. I landed a mile away. So further than anybody. So I was alone for a little while. No, there were no, nobody there to like yeah. greet me. I was alone in a field. Yeah. So it took me a couple of moments to realize that I, I wasn't seriously injured mm -hmm. and I actually made it. Wow. So it wasn't like a quick realization. It took a few beats of things to figure out that I actually pulled it off. And then that just has to be the best feeling in the world. It, I like to say it was a, a surreal feeling. Yeah. A surreal yeah. feeling that I actually finished out when my hero started. That's so cool. So then the bonus is you filmed this whole thing for it's a documentary, right? Yeah, it's a, a feature film documentary. And then you just sort of premiered it. Where was that at? Well, it, there was a chain of events that was very surreal and very cool all at the same time, which yeah. it, it, for me personally, it amped up the, the unbelievable level every time. Mm -hmm. I finished the film. Uh, my, my director, Kurt Matilla, and my, my business partner, Steve Golubioski, three of us together said, we're going to make this movie over this thing, and we did. The film, I, I get. It's hard to say whether it's good or bad because it's about me. Yeah, of course. you know. So yeah. how do you say? Yeah, you can but, never judge. But I do know that I'm proud of it. Yeah. So we had this thing that I was proud of. Well, the next thing that amped up the coolness for me was uh, Mr. Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. Yep. Saw the film, 
said, I want to be your executive producer. He and his partner, Danny Garcia, they have a company, Seven Bucks Productions. Yep. And 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 Dwayne Johnson and Danny Garcia said, we want to be your executive producers and we want to bring this to the world. Wow. Which to me was, all of a sudden now, I have the biggest action star in the world yeah. want to executive produce my movie. Yeah. So with that happening, at the same time, we entered it. We wanted to show everybody this film. So we entered, uh, we got into the LA Film Festival. Yep. And about... Uh, I don't know, it was about three weeks ago, we premiered the movie. Just, I was just hoping to, to get this movie out there to people to see it. Yeah. What I did not expect is that we would win the thing. And and my film actually won uh, audience, the, the, the award at the LA Film Festival. How cool. So it's kind of surreal, actually. Man. What a like ultimate cap, too, because like, I feel like landing the jump had to be one thing, but then to make this movie like how it turned out and then win, actually win an award. I mean, I don't know. It just has to be like kind of the ultimate because I know that wasn't the goal. It's no, like I never did this. Jump the, yeah. yeah, I never did. You know, Evil Knievel said something that was so prophetic at the time and I, and, and, and I don't think he even realized how prophetic it was. He said, you have to be willing to jump that canyon for nothing before yeah. you'll do it for anything. Yeah. And, and it seemed like that's what it took for me. I mean, at, at one point, there was nobody backing me. I, I actually had to pay for the whole thing because yeah. nobody wanted to risk reputation or, or their cash or whatever. Yeah. And you know, once you say you're going to do something, you better be prepared to put your money where your mouth is. Yeah. And I, in that sense, had to really put my money where my mouth was. Yeah, yeah. So I had to pay for it all. Yeah. Um, and that's a sobering, that's a whole nother the episode imagine. of this thing to yeah. tell you what that was like. Yeah, man. Um, so not only am I scared to death, I've also put, you know, pretty much all my money on the line yeah. that this was going to be a success. Yeah, that's a whole nother of like mom spaghetti and oh, uh, all bet. over your shirt. Yeah, it's oh, a different yeah. kind of yeah, totally. So it's a relief that I got across. It's a relief we have a film out of it, and it's a really a relief that it seems to be a film that people like. Yeah. And now it's going to be a huge success and you won't have to... I, I pray that it's going to be a huge success. We'll see. I mean, That's you know, great. at the end of the day, to me, the success, the success is internal. I mean, I did what I said I was going to do yeah. and I'm proud of what I did. Now I just, uh, you know, how it's perceived or received by everybody else, I can't judge that. I can't predict that. Yeah. But I'm proud of it. That's cool, man. It's a hell of a story. And I, like, I just can't, I can't wait to watch it and I can't wait to... It's just to me such a good you know, kind of ending. It, it's a really good way to leave the party while it's still cool, so to speak. You know what I mean? Well, And like have this really big movie and be able to kind of like do a transition or whatever you want to do on your own terms and with this kind of celebration. It just seems really cool to me. Well, one of the things internally, not externally, but internally satisfying to me was the fact that, you know, as a stuntman, mm -hmm. every stunt has pretty much been done. Mm -hmm. Motorcycle stunts have been done, car stunts, you know, fire, horses, they've all been done. They're just different variations, yeah. but it's the same stuff. But the chance to do something that no one else has ever done yeah. and probably no one else will ever do, yeah. as a stuntman, that, that's rare does that ever, if ever, come up. Yeah. And so internally satisfying was the fact that, hey, I may suck in a car or I may suck on a horse or whatever, but I'm still the only stunt guy yeah. that has ever done that and will ever do it. Yeah. Internally, that's kind of satisfying. And you have a movie about it. That's amazing. Well, yeah, <laughs> you know, you're like, go check this out. I have proof. Well, this beautifully shot movie, I'm guessing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just, it's, I'd like to say more of it is internal. Yeah. Even if nobody saw the film or yeah. even care, at least I, I know that, you know, hey, internally I did it. I gave it my best shot at least, you yeah. know? Let me ask you this. I want to I want to kind of end on this note. Do you have any advice kind of like I I kind of like I was poking around at in the beginning, I guess, but like you have mastered the art of facing your fears and doing these things. Even when you explain the building thing, it's like for someone who's afraid of heights to two times hang from the 21st story and get you know what I mean? And I feel like it sounds to me, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like it's given you 
a career path. It's given you fulfillment. It kept you out of trouble. Like it's, you know what I mean? My question is, do you have any advice to people when fear might be the thing sure. holding them back from their progress sure. and career? And Sure. Make a decision. Like I said, roads are paved with flat squirrels that couldn't decide. Yeah. Make a decision. Either go for it or don't go for it, but don't half step it. If you're going to go for it, you know, hang it all out there. Yeah. Because, you know, at worst, if you fail, at least you failed giving it your all. Yeah. Or don't even attempt it. Yeah. One or the other. But don't start and, and be indecisive. Yeah. Commit, fully commit, you know? Yeah. At least if you go if you go out, you go out fully committed and epically. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, I always thought I would either succeed epically or I'd fail epically. Yeah. But there would be no half stepping. Yeah. I thought that of the rocket too. I said, well, listen, if I succeed, it's going to be epic. Yeah. And if I fail, it's going to be an epic failure too. But it will not be any half stepping. Yep. And that's what I would tell somebody. Once you commit, if you reach that level that you're going to commit to anything, yep. whether it's a job interview, whether just go for it all the way. Don't kind of half step it. Don't. Yeah. Don't be a flat squirrel, man. Yeah. Make a decision. Don't be a flat squirrel. Yeah. That's good. That's what I, that's just my take on it. You nailed it. Anything that we're missing? Anything to, like, where do people stay up to date on what's going on with the movie? Well, um, sure. If you want to, you know, we, we, we have a social media presence. We're in, uh, you know, Instagram. I think we're Stuntman Movie. Um, or you can go to The Rock's Instagram. He talks about the film. Uh, he even shows a clip. Uh, under Rock's Instagram, or go to stuntmanmovie.com, or Stuntman Movie on Instagram, or you know I'm Crash for Cash on Instagram. Check it out. And what a name, Crash for Cash. Yeah, what I'm a always, username. I mean, I yeah. always thought that uh, you know they say, "What do you do?" Well, basically, I crash for cash. Yeah, that could be a whole game show on like ABC. Yeah, I don't know about <laughs> that. Say and think about it. Well, you're going to be a movie star soon. So no, just, you're have a lot that more I hope not. You know. <laughs> part of my movie is called Stuntman, yeah. But the other part of the title is the face you never see, yeah. Because that's I've formed a whole career of not seeing my face, not so anymore. I doubt you're going to really see me on, and, and I'm really uncomfortable doing that. Wait so. till people are you're going to be doing a bunch of these. This is going to nah, be <laughs> probably not. Once the movie's done, probably not. Yeah. No, this is not my forte, and you know my my palms are sweaty. And, yeah. And you're lucky I don't have spaghetti all over my yeah. shirt. Well, listen, is... you made it, man. You didn't get decapitated. Yeah. The shoots exactly. launched and we finished. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thanks for doing this. You, this, you did an incredible yeah. job. I know you were nervous drama. and you say you don't do this yeah, a lot. But, but... Drama, you, it, this is more like just talking to you on the couch. You know, The only That's thing we're missing goal. are the beers or something. There but you go. Uh, yeah, you made it kind of. Next you know. time we'll have beers. Perfect. Chris, there thanks for having yes, me. Yes, sir. Man. Thank you so it. much. Guys, if you like that and you want to see more like it as well as vlogs, other web series, and all the random stuff that I'm doing here on YouTube, don't forget to click that subscribe button. You won't regret it. I promise.